So our first talk is by Jean Yeo from uh, UCSD, and he'll be talking about modulating RNA diseases using CRISPR-Cas9. Great. Can you hear me at the back? OK. Um, thank you for the invitation to come here. I've not been here before. It's an amazing view of the building. And thanks for the fantastic talks this morning. Um, so uh, what I thought I'll do is not talk about stem cells, sorry, uh, and not talk about genome editing. I apologize. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about a different application for CRISPR-Cas that we are excited about. Um, and I think we'll, we'll come back eventually to uh, our interest in actually using stem cells. We do a lot of stem cell work to uh, generate uh, ASD models, uh, ALS models in the dish, but, but I'm not going to talk about that today. OK, so RNA, for, for folks that, uh, oops, this is not moving. Hmm. All right, I'll use this instead. OK, um, for those who have forgotten, uh, we know RNA can be used to measure the identity of cells. You can use uh, single cell RNA seq here um, frequently to do that. But, but we think of RNA as a more dynamic uh, state uh, where we have to, uh, ooh, thanks. We have to uh, understand how RNA is processed before the RNA molecule is then uh, matured, exported to the cytoplasm, and then translated into proteins. And so this is a picture showing RNA generated from obviously DNA, right, during transcription. And a lot of things happen here. So just to remind everybody what happens there, uh, a lot of stuff, right? So you have things like splicing, polydenylation, uh, RNA modifications like methylation, pseudoredylation. There are more modifications on RNA than there are on, on DNA, uh, transport, localization, translation, and so on. So a lot of things happen here. Um, and over the last uh, uh, decade, we've spent a lot of time trying to study uh, how RNAs get modulated uh, by studying RNA binding proteins that modulate these things. Um, how, but we also know that, uh, that when you have defects in any of these processes or defects in uh, interaction sites between RNA binding proteins and RNA, uh, you, can, you can get many different diseases. And, and these are RNA-related diseases, as follows. Um, and I'll mention a little bit about mitotic dystrophy today and ALS. So these are diseases that have a a strong RNA basis. Okay, so, so over the last couple of years, we've started to switch in not just understanding how RNA is processed uh, by studying what RNA binding proteins do, but by trying to engineer new ways to uh, modulate these processes with sort of engineered approaches. So in the past, we had engineered RNA binding proteins that did this, uh, but then we realized that uh, you can also repurpose CRISPR-Cas proteins to bind and modulate RNA. And, and initially, we just wanted to study uh, RNA processing, right? You can use these uh, uh, protein, engineered proteins or engineered CRISPR-Cas proteins to, to modulate things like splicing, uh, to, uh, to methylate RNA, to do different things. So that was sort of, sort of hope. Uh, but as the first pass, we wanted to see this, this even worked. And so we focused a little bit on localization. Uh, but then we realized we can do more with it. OK, so why RNA? Uh, thinking about therapeutics, right, you've already probably seen the slide um, from many different talks in, in the CRISPR, uh, CRISPR arena. Uh, uh, there are, you know, obviously a lot of effort in trying to use CRISPR genome editing to make ex vivo, uh, and ex vivo sort of therapeutics, right? So you can, you can uh, modify cells, put them back in, in an individual, um, uh, it's like SCD, for example, SC, sorry, SCD. Um, however, in vivo apl applications are still a bit difficult. Um, and, and so, so we started thinking about what are the, the limitations. Um, it's, it's an amazing technology, but there are some limitations. I think there are still uh, the risk of off-target edits. Um, you know, all you need is like one cell, maybe in a billion cells to have an off-target edit, and that might be bad, maybe. Um, Works really well in dividing cells, not so much in, in vivo and in, in non-dividing cells. Um, and for very highly polyploid organisms where you have to modify things, uh, modify genome, genetic material across uh, you know, you know, many, many copies, uh, that might be very difficult. Uh, we've been interested in viral RNAs, you know, where they're not, uh, maybe don't have a RT intermediate for DNA, you really have to edit only RNA, modify RNA. So we said, well, maybe we can try something different. And so we said, what about uh, uh, using the same systems but avoiding uh, DNA, try by just you know, modifying RNA anyways. Uh, that then prevents the, uh, the expression of bad toxic RNA or um, you know, 
bad sort of toxic proteins, right? So, so just a reminder that we can obviously have three billion bases here where if you have an off-target edit, um, you, uh, that's sort of bad, that's permanent. But, but you know, a few percent of the genome is expressed as protein coding genes, right? So you have a smaller window of like off-target edits. And, and worst case, um, it's sort of temporary, right? The RNA just gener generated, you made a mistake, it's dis destroyed, and it goes on. Okay, so uh, we first came about this uh, idea uh, around 2013, 2014. Uh, and so this is a, a paper from Jennifer Doutness lab showing the first um, repurposing of Cas9. Uh, so what she, what she did was she took a, a dead Cas9 uh, and then tricked it by putting a PAM oligomer. So you have an oligomer with a PAM recognition site in the oligar, oligo, and then you can trick Cas9 to bind in vitro um, to RNA. Okay, so this was sort of an, you know, a demonstration in vitro, and then we worked with her and said, well, well we, we are interested in RNA localization. Initially, it was in neurons, and, and so we said, well, just get a proof of concept. Can you then modify the oligo, PEM oligomer, so it works in vivo? Uh, let's trick the Cas9 uh, protein to bind RNA by having the PEM oligomer hybridize to the RNA, have the guy RNA also then be designed to uh, hybridize to the target mRNA, uh, and then just fuse uh, dead Cas9 with GFP. All right, so, so the idea here is that can you see um, uh, an mRNA that you target move to the cytoplasm, and when it's there, it will localize most of the Cas9 GFP into the cytoplasm. So this is the, this is the uh, sort of negative control, right, where you have Cas9 GFP uh, stuck in the uh, nucleus, right, because we stuck uh, several nuclear localization signals on Cas9. But uh, when you use a guide RNA and PAMR targeting gap DH mRNA, you can see the signal is pretty clean. It sort of moves out into the cytoplasm. So demonstrated the first sort of way of, of um, uh, bringing Cas to a, sort of in vivo RNA um, um, application. And so we were actually rather embarrassed because right after this, a lot of people said, oh, you can do many things like treating muscular dystrophy, neurodegeneration, and so on. Uh, when in fact, we hadn't really thought about this yet, but we figured since they mentioned it, why don't we work on it, right? Um, and so we had a postdoc join the lab that was interested in myotonic dystrophy. And this is a terrible disease, right? So you have uh, atrophy of, of muscle. There's also a CNS disorder where you have uh, memory loss, uh, sleep abnormalities, uh, and cardiac conduction issues. In congenital cases, uh, you have uh, uh, large expansions that I'll, well, I'll mention about in the next slide. You know, these kids are, are, uh, 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 suffer very quickly, and, and they're not usually a fatal disease. So, so DM was, was our prototype model to think about targeting uh, RNA-related diseases. Okay, it belongs to a class of diseases known as microsatellite expansion diseases. Uh, there are many of these, uh, 30 to 40 of these diseases. Um, and so they're typified by having uh, uh, DNA repeats, short ones, GAA or G4, C2, uh, or in our case of DM, CTG repeats, which are expanded in a gene loci. And they can be expanded a thousand uh, 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 copies of this short repeat, uh, and they can be also somewhat sometimes heterogeneous uh, within the sequence itself, right? And so, for example, in the case of D1, DM1 and DM2 in, in muscular dystrophy type 1 and type 2, uh, these repeats are simple, CTG repeats. They are expressed, right, in, three prime, in the 3' prime UTR of the DMPK gene and a different gene for DM2. So they're expressed, they're processed. In this case, it's an intron, in this case, it's a UTR. And what happens is they act as sinks. So they sequester proteins that like to bind them, uh, for example, muscle blind like one, two, and three, which are RNA binding proteins. They like to bind uh, primary CDG sequences, but also structure, and they sequester them. So because these proteins are sequestered in the nucleus, uh, then, then they cannot perform their normal functions, which is to control splicing of many downstream genes, so hundreds of genes. Okay, so you've got this, repeats are expressed as RNA, they, they sequester proteins, um, and these repeats are abundant enough that you can do an RNA fish and you can see them in the nuclear of, nucleus of these cells, right? Okay, so you disrupt splicing, it's, it's bad, you get myotonic dystrophy. So we figured, uh, can you first visualize, like we did before in our previous paper, can we visualize the repeats, right, with our Cas9? And so here is just, you know, GFP uh, uh, fused Cas9, right? Uh, dead Cas9, and this is just RNA fish showing the, uh, with CAG, which is complementary to CTG. So you can see the, um, the CUG repeats uh, in the cell. Uh, but when you treat uh, uh, the cells with targeting guide to CDG, and, and in this case also a targeting PAMR, uh, then you can see pretty nice localization of CAS with the repeats. 
So CAS GFP is now binding to these repeats. And they're so highly uh, you know, abundant and repetitive that they se start sequestering um, um, uh, Cas9 to, uh, to, to, the, to, its, to itself, right, to the repeat itself. But interestingly enough, when you don't even use the PAM oligomer, uh, you can actually still recognize the foci. Maybe not as sensitive, but because there's so many repeats, they still sequester it without uh, the PAM oligomer. So that means just Cas9 alone can just bind RNA. Um, turns out that this is true now in, you know, from many labs. People have shown SA Cas9, uh, CJE Cas9 many. Also, you know, author logs of just uh, uh, Cas, uh, S pyogenes Cas9 can also bind uh, uh, RNA. And so we were able to now show this with many other re repetitive sequences. So the CAG repeat sequence in, in uh, SCA1, 2, and Huntington's disease, uh, DM2, CCUG repeats, right? So you can uh, see localization with the repeats. Okay, so then we said, well, this is cool. We can see the repeats now in, in live cells. You can image them moving around. I'm not going to show any videos. But what was interesting was that, that now you can, can fuse uh, these basically RNA binding protein that you just engineered um, with endonucleases. And so we can search for uh, different endonucleases. Uh, we ended up using uh, the PIN1 endonuclease from the SMUG, uh, one of the SMUG autologs which is a low turnover enzyme. Uh, so, that, so that means that you can recruit Cas to these repeats and chew it up, right? So you can destroy the repeats. And so these are cells uh, in green that express uh, 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 the Cas9 with the uh, targeting guide. Um, and you can see that cells which express it destroy, have no more repeats, right? So the repeats are gone. Um, so you can show this with northern blots. Um, uh, you can show this with uh, QPCR of the, the, uh, the allele with the repeat, for example. Uh, and you can show that this works for many different, many different repeats in different diseases, um, ALS, DM1, DM2, and so on. So one question was, since it's Cas9, how do you know it's just not binding DNA as well as just RNA, right? Um, and so we did this experiment where we used a doxycycline inducible system, TET inducible system, uh, where on the same uh, promoter here, uh, sorry, on the same TET response element here, uh, you can express uh, GFP on one, one side, and then on the other side, you express the DMPK locus with the CTG repeats. Okay. So the experiment was as follows. You, we, we wanted to show that, that Cas9 was not just binding the CTG repeats at the DNA level and inhibiting transcription. Because then that could be another, uh, um, a, you know, that could be interesting, but, but that's not what we, were, we believe was happening because we we're using the, these endonucleases, right? Um, and so we were able to show that if you express this GFP uh, and then uh, at the same time, you transfect uh, uh, Cas9, Cas9 GFP, uh, but then you remove the doxycycline. So, uh, so this, these RNAs are no, no longer made. They're just, I mean, they're no longer continually expressed. Whatever RNA that you have made from GFP and from the, the CTG repeats are already there in the cell. And yet, uh, yet this, uh, uh, these plasmids were able to destroy the RNA over time. So it's like, well, okay, so transcription is done. You have RNA in the cell. And then these uh, proteins are able to still go there and bind the RNA and destroy them. And you can, there are many ways to like, show this with dot, blot, dot blots, um, qPCR, and so on. Okay, so you can reduce this RNA foci to independent of transcription. So these are all just in, those are all just in cells you transfected repeats, right? Repeat sequences. What about in patient, patient myoblasts? So DM1 patients, you can do punch biopsies. Um, grow up these uh, myoblasts, uh, and you can do the same CAG10 complementary probe for CTG, for RNA fish, right? So you can see uh, you know, these dots, right, in, uh, in this DM1 fibroblast. Uh, in a non-targeting case, you can see these uh, repeats. Uh, but in the targeting case, uh, the uh, full size is gone. So this also works in patient, um, patient myoblasts. So, so destroying the repeats are one thing, but it doesn't really cure the disease unless you can repair all the downstream changes that the repeats um, uh, cause, right? Which is like sequestering muscle blind and then causing splicing changes. Um, so uh, one of the, the key measurements we wanted to make was, was, you know, can you release muscle blind back to its normal, normal duties? Can you release back to its normal localization? So if you have CUG expressed in a cell, um, so this is normal, normal localization of a muscle blind protein, which is nuclear, and then it's kind of a you know, sh little bit in the cytoplasm, but diffuse. But if you express CTG repeats, muscle blind gets trapped. Um, the nice thing here is that if you destroy the repeats with the CUG targeting uh, CRISPR system, right, then muscle blind localization goes back. So that's like step, you know, step two, right? So destroyed RNA foci, re re um, 
relief muscle blind localization. Now what about the muscle blind targets, which is downstream of muscle blind? Okay, so I, I need to sort of explain this a little bit. So muscle blind, as I mentioned, is sequestered. And then, you know, because it's sequestered, it's, 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 it moves away from their, its normal targets, which are these pre-mRNA messages in the cell to control splicing. So these are just RT-PCR um, uh, 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 images, right, uh, in gel electrophoresis, right, where you show two different bands. Hopefully you can see two bands. Uh, these are uh, RT-PCR primer probes on the flanking axons, right, of a target axon, which we know is alternatively spliced. So that means there are, there are normally two, two isoforms of the same gene um, in the cell. So control myoblasts, and then DM1 patient myoblasts. Okay. So you can see like uh, there's one band here uh, for control patients with non-targeting guide, and then targeting guide, you've got still one band. That's, that's fine, right? Because it's you know, not destroying any CDG repeats. But in the DM1 myoblast, you see there's a funny isoform. There are two, two isoforms now that's being generated because the muscle blind is sequestered. While with targeting guide, you can restore the isoform sort of back to, back to normal, which is kind of nice, right? And, and you can do this not for just one gene, but here are the, the main ones uh, that, um, for example, the FDA is using uh, to measure efficacy for a DM treatment. Uh, but we said, let's just, you know, what about all the other ones? So muscle blind is a splicing tar uh, protein, which means it affects not just one or a few, but hundreds of targets. Uh, so we did RNA-seq, um, and just to show on a few examples how they look like before we look at the transcriptome-wide view, you can see that in the myoblast from patients, DM1, uh, from DM1 patients, CDG targeting, uh, guide is destroying the repeats, right? So the, so the isoform now is switching back to wild type, right? Whereas in the DM1 patients with GFP treatment or non-targeting guide, you still have these uh, funny isoforms that are being created. Um, so genome-wide look uh, is as follows, right? So uh, each dot here, each dot is the splicing uh, inclusion of a particular exon for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of exons. And, and, and it's a measure of zero to one, it's a 100% inclusion or exclusion that's different between, uh, oops, that's different between uh, the DM1 non-targeting guide, right, and then just control non-targeting guide. So basically the difference between DM1 myoblast and then control myoblast. We remove all the dots in the middle because those are splicing events which are not very different between DM1 patients and control myoblast. So all the dots here are isoforms which are the most different. What's nice is that if you treat with CDG targeting guide, you see that you have a, you know, a, re a, a reversal. Basically, all these dots here are like moving back to the middle. So they're, they're becoming normalized <laughs> back to a control, what it would like, look like in a control patient. Okay, um, so we see a sort of a dramatic uh, uh, reversal of splicing changes in patient myotubes as well, right? Um, and, and in treating this. So this actually is the sort of the greatest uh, and most precise number of changes, right, you can do res to show restoration of the you know, aberrant uh, uh, effects downstream of expanded repeat uh, that we've ever seen. So we've, we've, others have used oligos, sRNAs, small molecules, right? This is a sort of a, a dramatic, dramatic shift back to normality. Um, so this was then published uh, showing that we, we think we can hit DM, Huntington's disease, and then in the paper we mentioned a little bit and show some, some data on C9 ALS. And so then, you know, people are very excited, and, I, and we were, again, embarrassed because we said, well, we have not even tried anything in vivo. Uh, so then, we, you know, this is forcing us to run faster than, than um, reporters, which is, which is not a good thing. So we said, let's try this in vivo. And so we tried two experiments. One was uh, in a DM1 mice, mice model. Uh, so we can use AAV, and we managed to shrink Cas9. So in the original paper, we were able to... Um, cut out all the components of Cas9 which bound DNA. So we made it even smaller, able to then put the guide RNA in the same vector uh, and then treat mice in, in a single vector of AV. Uh, now there are other um, forms of Cas, so different CJE Cas9, SA Cas9, uh, which, uh, which are actually smaller and we're able to sort of engineer uh, also smaller endonucleases, put them all together in one AV. So in these uh, mice models, uh, uh, they express long repeats, so LR, long repeats, uh, in the uh, muscle of these mice, and they get DM1 type phenotypes. Uh, so as an experiment, we injected uh, the uh, guides here, uh, and then uh, a CDG targeting guide, and then a control guide, um, and just to see whether we get um, molecular restoration, cell, cell, uh, cell biology restoration. 
okay, so what was, what was comforting was that we, when we measured splicing again, so again, you know, the few key ones just to show on RT, by RT-PCR, we're able to see that in the mice model, uh, you have these uh, two, sort of, two bands representing a, uh, different isoforms of the chloride channel, one gene that's disrupted because muscle blind is sequestered. Um, but if you target uh, the CDG uh, repeats, right, RNA repeats, you're now restoring the isoforms back to normal. In fact, uh, you restore not only the, uh, the splicing, but the protein levels of the chloride channel gene, which is the key gene important for my myotonia in people and, in, and obviously in the mice. Uh, so in green is the chloride channel, uh, protein levels, which is restored in the CDG targeted limb of the uh, of the mice, but not the, not in the non-targeting, and so you can restore uh, you know uh, about 86% uh, of the splicing markers in um, in the in the mice as well. Okay, um, okay, uh, great. Well, a few more slides, and then so we also see that we can actually reduce uh, myo uh, nuclei, nuclei, which is a hallmark of uh, sort of the disease pathology. Uh, you see in the mice and also in patients. So this is now restored. I'm not sort of going to go over it sort of too much detail. Um, and so far, so far we don't see uh, a tremendous uh, immune response, which is kind of surprising. So so far, so um, so this is still ongoing work. Uh, we're still uh, working on on different components of this. Um, but uh, after the the second paper, folks wanted us to try to push to non-human primate models, uh, which is the second model and then uh, hopefully to people. And so we have a small little company in San Diego attempting to do that. Um, and so that's sort of ongoing. Okay, uh, we think that this idea is kind of odd, right? Because in, in, in the space of sort of genome engineering, but it's actually um, a rapidly growing area of interest with you know, papers coming out from Feng, Feng Zhang's right, a lab, right? Jennifer's lab, and now also a company, an RNA uh, sort of company uh, called Arbor Therapeutics, and Patrick Xu has a new also paper at the same time with a new cas protein that binds only RNA. So, so I think it's, a, it's an interesting area. It's, it's growing. A lot of things you can do with this. Um, I hope um, you get a chance to uh, do something useful. All right, so just uh, so the first uh, paper I mentioned was the first RNA targeting of cas and, and live cells with Jennifer's lab. And then a uh, uh, demonstration that we can uh, do this in, in microcellular expansion diseases as a proof of concept. This is together with Molly Swanson, who is an expert in DM. And, and the two uh, uh, postdocs in my lab, Dave and Ron, uh, worked on this project. Dave was a grad student then, and, and now he's now both uh, Dave and Ron are full time in Locana, trying to uh, push this to uh, to actually hopefully people. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much to my lab at UCSD and for the invitation. Questions. Give us some sense of how you would compare this to antisense and RNAi. Great question. So in the original manuscript um, for the DM uh, cases, uh, reverse asked exactly the same question. Have you looked at compared to sRNA, ASOs? So the, the problem uh, with, with sRNAs is that they, they work really well in the cytoplasm. These repeats are nuclear repeats. Uh, so that was an issue that we, we tried and we couldn't get uh, down regulation. Um, ASO, so Ionis's uh, ASO trial for DM uh, got shut down uh, last this year, this year uh, because of bioavailability. So they're able to get the ASOs, uh, as you know, they, they diffuse passively in, in tissues, um, but they were not able to get enough of them, right, in the right tissue, and couldn't get efficacy, right. So we compared their ASO data with with uh, our data, and in terms of these the the biomarkers that they measured, they measured these five biomarkers. We see dramatic change with our techno you know, idea, right? Um, but we also see transcriptome-wide reversal. So I think, for whatever reason, which you're not quite clear, right? The the CAS and the guide seems to be uh, much better at targeting these things. Um, and and the beauty is because we can deliver uh, beauty or weakness, we can deliver with AV. We're able to now target um, with much greater cell type specificity. Um, and you know, obviously, the the issue. Uh, is well, you know, can we can we keep packaging them smaller? There's a manufacturing issue, all this stuff, right? So we are working on that. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, Bruce, Bruce, uh, do you need a mic? Uh, 
<clears throat> uh, love, lovely data there. Um, I, for uh, you said that you were surprised that there wasn't a an immune response, and yep. and actually, uh, so am I. Um, what what uh, plans do you have in using it in people? Because right. uh, it's known that people have antibodies to this mm -hmm. bacterial protein, and That's right. and it's also been shown, for instance, where people take cells that express, say, the transactivator in it, and transfer transfer it to other cell types that you can have massive. Uh, you know, uh, detrimental uh, immune responses mm -hmm. to uh, bacterial protein. Right, great, great question. So, so within the lab, we're exploring different applications of this now, but within the company, I can say that they are um, evolving ways to uh, minimize um, um, uh, epitope presentation of the protein. We've also now done screens to find other proteins which people have not been exposed to um, in the space. Um, and, and we are trying different regimens, um, uh, so immune modulators at the same time, uh, to build tolerance to the protein. So there are, there are efforts ongoing. I think some of these efforts are also being performed um, by the genome editing companies, right, um, editors and so on. So um, I think we are in good company in terms of the hurdles, I think, for immunogenicity. Um, but yeah. Right. I mean, they call it hit, and hit and run. Right. Right. Yeah. And, uh, the, the, and this is hit and stay. That's right. Yes. And, and the staying part for immunogenicity is, is a lot. Yes. Yeah. We are doing the in vivo models now. So far, um, nothing. We you know treating with different immune modulators. We've been we've been actually it's been tolerable. Let's put it that way. So so still still working on it. Yeah. Uh, I wonder in your in vivo experiment. Uh, have you demonstrated the functional restriction, I mean, the contractile force? Right. So those are being measured. Uh, we're doing rotor rod treatments, uh, measurements, uh, and now we're doing some work in the CNS for DM as well, DM mice. Uh, so there we're looking at other behavioral phenotypes. But that's still ongoing. Still ongoing. It's been six months, basically, yeah. Well, so um, current there are you know 100 something, 150 something gene therapy trials so far in in you know in the in the world, and and I think there are um, you know examples where where uh, transgenes have been around for 10, 15 years, so we don't know, right? And and that's something that that we will have to evaluate. Um, can we keep the transgenes in there for the lifetime of the individual? Um, yeah. So so this, these are all issues that we are. We and the other folks in the gene therapy field uh, are exploring. Yeah. Sorry, I have one quick question. So, what about non-coding like tRNAs right. and rRNAs and all right. that? Right. Yeah. So we've been able, you know, in principle. So in principle, you should be able to target, you know, circular RNAs, um, tRNAs, and so on. Uh, we are also evaluating that uh, more for basic biology uh, things in the lab. Um, yeah. Great to visualize that in the nucleus and the nucleus. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Tools. Yeah. Thank tools. you, Gene. Yeah. Very you. interesting talk. Um, so our last speaker.